Welcome to VALS's International Women's Day webinar, Addressing Coercive Control Without Criminalization. I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people's traditional owners, traditional custodians of land that I'm on today, which is our VALS president office, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge they were all on Aboriginal lands across Australia. Sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm Narita Waite. I'm a proud Aboriginal woman and I'm the CEO of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. Before becoming CEO, believe it or not, I actually used to be a lawyer and I worked in various practice areas, but one of my favourites was working in a family and youth team here at Bowles, where I saw the impacts of coercive control and have also seen how criminalisation can be a blunt tool that often creates more harm for victim survivors, their families and their communities. The staff at Vow see the consequences of poorly thought out and poorly implemented laws each and every day. We work as hard as we can to help prevent or reverse the damage that justice system can do. As part of that work, we have put our knowledge and the experience of our clients into a policy paper that we published early this year titled Addressing Coercive Control Without Criminalisation, Avoiding Blunt Tools That Harm Victim Survivors. This work was inspired by incredible Aboriginal women and people who led a conversation about the harms that criminalising coercive control can inflict on our communities. And we're very fortunate to have some of those Aboriginal people on our panel today. We have Nova Gori, who's writer, Amanda Porter, senior fellow, and Dr Crystal McKinnon, VALS board member, academic, researcher and community organiser. A content warning before we start. We'll be discussing issues that will potentially include references to Aboriginal and Islander people who have deceased, trauma, violence, abuse, racism and coarse language. If any part of our discussion raises issues or concerns for you, we encourage Aboriginal and Islander people to call Yarning Safe and Strong, a helpline run by a very own Victorian Aboriginal Health Service on 1800 959 563 and everyone else can call Lifeline on 13 11 14. To begin the webinar, we are going to play a community legal education video about coercive control that we have recorded. It is a quick chat between our VALS community legal officer, Tanning Onus Williams, and Jürgen Kahn, our principal managing lawyer of Aboriginal Families Practice at VALS. It should provide some useful context for everyone before we get into the panel discussion. Hello, my name's Tanine Onus Williams, and I'm a proud Gunjmara, Bindu, Yorta Yorta, and Torsha Islander person. And I am the community legal educator at the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service. And today we are you know, talking about coercive control and addressing coercive control without criminalization. And we got one of our lawyers to come and speak with us just to educate you about what coercive control is, what it can look like, and what are the implications? So I'll get you to introduce yourself. Okay. Hi, my name is Jürgen. I'm the Principal Solicitor um, for the Family Practice of Vales. Thanks, Jürgen, for coming in and joining us today. I really appreciate it. And I really think that your expertise is needed uh, in this conversation. So I just wanted to know if you can tell us what coercive control is. Thanks, Tony. So Coercive control is really family violence, and it's it's really family violence uh, of the most hidden and insidious type. And given its nature, it's really difficult to identify the more obvious forms of family violence, like, say, physical violence or monetary control, stuff like that. So it's a very hidden form of family violence. And, like, what can it look like? There's a whole lot of things that coercive control uh, looks like. There's isolating behaviour, so... Uh, People can be isolated from their family or their friends or from their social uh, events or social network. There's monitoring behaviour where the other person demands to know where that person is all the time. They check their phone, they check their emails, they go through texts. Um, In extreme cases, they might even uh, install cameras and GPS software in the phones. And there's also that sort of restricting type behaviour where a person might uh, remove access to finances, where they might remove access to a vehicle. They might go on and change passwords so people can't use social media. They might hide or destroy um, social media devices. And there's also controlling type behaviour. And that's this is really insidious where they they sort of say, you know, control uh, what a victim wears, what they eat, what they drink, how they do their hair, 
Uh, they might tell them to exercise more. Or they might tell them to you know lose a bit of weight, gain a bit of weight. And in more extreme cases, they might even convince the other person that they're ill or forgetful or have some sort of mental illness. And that that then um, crosses over in, in extreme form of gaslighting. To the outside world, it seems like it's a bit of a joke, but to the to the target person, it just erodes their self worth. There's also things like um, psychological threats, and these are pretty common where they say, oh, I'm leaving, I'm going to kill myself, uh, I'm going to take the kids, those sort of things. Um, and um, sadly, um, perpetrators often use the legal system as a form of coercive control. Um, they might tell the other party that um, there's something wrong with them, they're a bad parent, they're going to call child safety, they're going to take a family violence order out, or they're going to go to court and get parenting orders. So coercive control seems like it is broad and it can be used in so many different ways and I guess that's why lots of people are having the conversation around the criminalisation of it. Thank you for giving those examples. I think we really needed to have the examples of what coercive control is going into this conversation. How is coercive control already included in the legislation and how can people access it if they wanted to? Okay, so in Victoria, the only remedy is a family violence order uh, under the Family Violence Protection Act. The the Act already contemplates that sort of behaviour, so it defines defines family violence as physical or sexual abuse, emotional or psychological abuse, uh, economic abuse, um, behaviour that's threatening or coercive or in any way controls or dominates someone. So it's already contemplated in the Act. Uh, specifically as coercive abuse, but also as emotional or psychological abuse. If a person wants to access protection under the Family Violence Act, they can make an application for a Family Violence Protection Order, provided that they are a family member, or the other person rather is a family member, member, or someone like a family member. Uh, That is, that the other person is regarded as family, I guess, you know, that they're so Mm -hmm. close to their domestic partner or a former domestic partner or a relative. And the Act also contemplates the wider definition of a, of a relative for First Nations people. Mm-hmm. So the victim can make the application themselves or they can have an authorised person make it, usually police or a lawyer. So the family tenant vows can provide options for that and that call if someone made it would, would be completely confidential and we'd, I mean, we'd never give a call or details to anyone or indeed confirm if someone has called up. So a person who's a victim of this sort of behaviour need never worry that someone can just ring up and say, you know, did so-and-so ring up? So then uh, the matter is heard through court on a very quite a low standard of proof because it's a civil matter and that person is then protected, afforded protection for the duration of the act, usually from two years upwards. Okay, yeah. Thank you. I didn't know that... um... There's a broader definition as well for First Nations people. There is. So, um, and, and this was contemplated in the Act some time ago. Um, yeah. Uh, so just like in the Family Law Act. So um, it's it's excellent to have that in there because often, you know, what, what the white community sees as a relative is narrow compared to what First Nations people see as a relative. And the last question I have for you is... What are the implications of having a separate law and it being introduced in Victoria? Yeah, so so there's a really strong push at the moment to, to criminalise coercive control. And so to date, uh, it's only Tasmania that has actually criminalised it. So, um, But that said, uh, Victoria has a family violence order and a breach of that order is a criminal offence. Uh, I think a Royal Commission was held in 2016 in Victoria. There were 277 recommendations out of that. Uh, criminalising course of control wasn't one of those recommendations. So, and there are some sound points for and against criminalisation. But the benefits for um, are that the prosecution prosecution time gap is is um, minimised. So, currently, if um, if there's a family violence order in place, um, then a breach needs to report it to police. The police needs to raise a charge. And that order is then prosecuted by police and goes to court. Making the behaviour an offence would cut part of that step out and the police could prosecute that uh, without a family violence order first. There are also some questions that probably need to be answered before we step into the criminalisation zone. 
Um, and that is that a, a breach of a family of violence that already does carry a criminal penalty. So the criminal penalty is already there, but we just have to sort of go around in a bit of a, a longer way than we would have liked to. The other issue that I guess I've got is that the, the very nature of coercive control can and often does lead the <clears throat> lead the offence uh, being misapplied to the victim. So, and that that's a particular problem for, for First Nations women who might already face state discrimination uh, and the repercussions of that, you know, a state intervention, removal of children and really the destruction of the family unit. So it's a step to take pretty carefully. Coercive control is really hard to prosecute to a criminal standard, uh, again, because of its almost secretive nature and, and it's not, coercive control isn't like a physical violence where it's pretty obvious if you've hit someone. It's pretty obvious you've smashed their window. It's pretty obvious if you've, you know, driven their car over a cliff or something. All those sort of things are really obvious, but coercive control is a whole series of little things. They're hidden away. They're just just small things that you chip away at someone, and they're not always obvious. Um, so to prosecute, that's really difficult. Um, and I guess my last point is that, um, which links into that, is that police probably at this point are not really properly equipped to recognise coercive behaviour. I just don't think that it should be criminalised, like you said, because if, you know, First Nations women being, you know, misidentified, you know, Miss Julika Ju um, was a perfect example of Aboriginal women going to the police for assistance for family violence and there needs to be more work um, done at, at preventing violence and harm in our communities. So, yeah, thank you so much. For I, I think that the, the risk involved with criminalisation far outweighs the, the benefit that, that could come from it, so that the risk to, to, the, to First Nations women, their children and their families mm. far outweighs the, the, the benefit that could come out of it, which is, which is only procedural at this point. Thank you so much, Jurgen, for joining us and really grateful that you were able to speak with us and talk to us about coercive control and let us know what it, what it is and um, what are the, the implications of it are, are and the effects that it can have on um, our communities. Thank you. Thank you. A big thanks to Tanin and Jurgen for recording that chat about coercive control and I urge all those participants here today to make sure that once that video is live on our website and our socials that you share it with clients and mob to really just give them a good understanding of what coercive control is. Now we're incredibly lucky to have a recorded address by Professor Chelsea Watego, who is a Professor of Indigenous Health at QUT. Chelsea is a strong voice in the public discussion about coercive control and criminalisation and was one of the driving forces behind our policy paper. It's a powerful address that speaks to some of the issues that inspired us at VOWS to publish our policy paper and host this webinar, but also incredibly powerful for lawyers practising in the field today. Thank you. I wish to acknowledge the unceded sovereignty of the lands from which we speak and gather today as a Mananjali woman on Yagara country to that of the Kulin nations and across this continent. I feel very privileged to be invited by the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service to speak today to the matter of coercive control, or rather the matter of criminalising coercive control. I do so, I guess, keenly aware of the violence we encounter as blackfellas entering into this conversation to insist on speaking of experience at this place or bringing our own knowledges to bear to offer solutions beyond that of incarceration. That we may think beyond the carceral response is to incite violence from those who can't imagine a solution that doesn't necessitate yet more of it. In as much as victims of a coercive control experience a sense of powerlessness of experiencing a form of violence that is not as visible as other forms, Black women, non-binary and trans fam have experienced this exact violence in entering into this conversation. The carceral feminists, whether they be journalists or academics, really need not lecture us on violence when they have been so reluctant to own up to their own. And they need to keep their hands off our trauma as their moral imperative to act because if they truly cared about our experience, they would not be calling for more of our people to get locked up. I speak as someone who has experienced violence, not from my spouse, but from the state, at the hands of police on multiple occasions and from carceral feminists the moment I entered into this conversation. 
at the request of Sisters Inside in my capacity as Director of the Institute for Collaborative Race Research and as a scholar. I also speak from my experiences of having supported Indigenous family members who've experienced family violence yet have been denied safety, care and protection from health and social services, lawyers, police and the courts. Now, I don't claim their experience of violence, but in bearing witness to how it was a visit upon them in the process by which they sought care and protection, I cannot be silent about that either. And amidst this talk or women's summits last year, I dared respond to a request from ABC local radio to speak of the limitations of the Queensland Premier's calls for a national women's summit. I pointed out much like our sisters have done long before us, Professor Larissa Brent, Professor Jackie Huggins and Professor Ali Morton Robinson, that we are not a subset of the category of women with shared realities and aspirations for all our emancipation. Our experiences and thus our solutions are uniquely different. I pointed out these differences where she had said that the big issues were the pay gap, superannuation, childcare and workplace sexual harassment, and in doing so evoked an imagining of who she considers belongs to the category of woman. I highlighted that while they are trying to get women into work and on boards, we are trying to keep women out of jail. While I speak of how expensive childcare is, we speak of the trauma of child removal and the violence that comes with our kids being in supposed care. While I speak of superannuation, we talk about a life expectancy that falls short of retirement age. And when they speak of sex discrimination, our calls to attend to race discrimination falls on deaf ears. Now, this little seven-minute interview would result not in a reply from the Premier who denied to comment, but a summonsing of her public servants to effectively dismiss my concerns. Attached to that interview is a 1,600-word response that spoke not of the limitations of the Premier's feminist imagination, but of our gap and our disadvantage, followed by a list of services they fund, the division of which is largely apportioned to itself. Via a state-run health service, the same service that failed my family when they were seeking care. I was reminded of the Indigenous expertise of the just one Indigenous woman rep represented on their women's task force, and I was told that the Flawed Women's Summit would be, and I quote, a great way for people like me to voice their concerns and give their suggestions to help affect generational change, particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. It was very much a get in line, wait your turn, know your place kind of feminism that black women know too well in this place. And this is the kind of gaslighting so inherent in the violence of coercive control conversations. In speaking out, even the processes that they design and claim include us, we are told that we don't care about other women and or we should at least be grateful for the good things they do for us. It was during this time that I was called to meet with the chair of the Queensland Women's Safety Task Force, not with my co-authors on the submission we made, but just me. The conversation was met with, we appreciate your submission, but we've talked to other Indigenous women who want to feel safe as though the safety of Indigenous women is not central to our concerns. But casting Black women as uncaring and unloving is the same move that the police make in supposedly misidentifying us as perpetrators when it comes to family violence. They are all part of the same machinery of racial violence in the colony. What fucking hope is there? It does not matter the evidence base we bring, the pal palatability of our delivery or the generosity we afford those who are least deserving. And it's not like we can ever leave this violent relationship. Our only option is to build regardless and refuse to appeal to the real perpetrators in all of this. We must find ways to do the work we know is necessary to protecting our people, men, women and children. To speak of family violence in an Indigenous context means to imagine the humanity of us all, as well as all forms of violence. And that's the one thing I've grown the most strength from in amongst all of this is the leadership culturally, politically and intellectually of black women, non-binary and trans mob who still lead with love every day in this place while struggling to live. And it's for this reason I wish to commend the work of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service for creating the space for this conversation and amplifying the voices of some of our thought leaders in this place, Nayuka Gori, Dr Amanda Porter and Dr Crystal McKinnon. You will note that what they offer is, is not just an appeal to the expansion of the category of woman or what constitutes violence, but are showing what it is to be fully human, both in our understanding of the problem and the solutions that are available to us. Thank you. I'm sure everybody listening to this webinar found that incredibly powerful and influential and it's certainly going to help inform the discussion that we have with our incredible panellists today. So let's launch in to these questions because I'm sure we're going to have so many more from our large audience. So first question. 
Um, Aboriginal women, non-binary and trans mob are so often shut out of public debates about the justice system, and that has certainly been the case around discussion of criminalising coercive control. What are some of the factors that allow institutions and individuals to silence our voices? And I'm going to start with uh, Dr Crystal McKinnon on that one. Hey, thanks for having me. Just want to say that I'm a little bit nervous because of all the people watching. And um, so, <laughs> but thanks for um, having us. So why, I think I think Chelsea's um, incredible paper discussion, um, what she said before highlights some of the reasons why. There seems to be a real division between those people who think that the criminal justice system and police are there to protect them versus kind of Aboriginal um, community and, uh, you know, other um, black and minority communities that the system targets. It's this real, like, where we're trying to, uh, how do you say, we're trying to um, stop the system doing more harm, I guess, since there's this real kind of binary oppositions between um, us and them and... um, and people that are supporting the system are more dominant, so the other voices get kind of silenced. I think um, that's one of the one of the reasons. Um, Nay, Amanda, what do you guys think? I'll jump in. Um, can you, Crystal? Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Oh, good. <laughs> I think. Um, I think some of the factors around why we're not being heard are that, like, in the collective imagination of this colony, we're seen as, like, black women and non-binary people are seen as the victims. We are spoken about. We are the objects of research. But when we dare shift the gaze or break out of, you know, their imagination of what we are, we are seen as violent. We're seen as trolling, especially online. We're irrational. And then white womanhood is weaponized against us. So whiteness is objective and anything else, anyone else, minoritised groups or marginalised groups um, are subjective and emotional and irrational. I think as well, I think it's, I think it, another part of it is there's a real lack of imagination. I think this country or this colony has been trained from hundreds of years of colonisation with having origins of as a penal colony um, that the fir- the mentality and the mentality that comes with that is to first respond with a carceral and punitive approach, um, and we know as black fellas after hun- you know of hundreds of years of research, our own data that that doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. Um. Sorry, hi. Um, yeah, I also just want to say I'm extremely nervous and not a good speaker at the best of times and really flattered to be invited to be on the panel, but hugely intimidated to and feeling kind of inadequate um, being on a panel alongside Professor Watergo, um, Tarnine, um, Nayuka, Crystal, Narita, yourself and um, and others. Um, I'm definitely the weakest link. Um, but um, we'll add to those um, points only um, by saying that yeah, I think part of it w- was what Crystal and Naku were saying about silencing and being excluded from debates and that, yeah, Aboriginal women, non-binary and trans voices and perspectives are just written out of, of uh, and not deemed worthy of attention by the Australian corporate media, by um, in public debates, in school and uni curriculum, in history books. Um, and when it comes to... Um, debates about criminalising or decriminalising um, anything, um, we should be centering and prioritising these voices, um, not just because um, these are the most marginalised and over- overlooked voices in the community, but because um, Aboriginal women um, and Aboriginal families and trans activists are the ones leading the campaigns in this space, um, whether it's the work of the um, Incarcerated Trans and Gender Diverse Collective or the work of um, the Dajawa Foundation and the Day family who are leading the ones leading the campaign to decriminalise public drunkenness. Um, There's so many more examples I could draw on. Um, And I think um, in terms of why why these voices are, why voices are um, excluded from the conversation, I think part of it goes to um, what Naika was saying about um, that deeply embedded, um, you know, penal 
colony mentality. Um, and, and it's also just part of, um, uh, which is part of the Australian corporate media, which deems that only some women are worthy of attention and only some women are deserving of that victim status. And that's the ideal victim the, who's white, cisgendered, able-bodied, neurotypical and importantly, middle class. Um, um, but uh, that that's part of, um, you know, I don't really have a, 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 the vocab to express it, but I think part of it's an extension of that populist law and order politics kind of um, thinking that, um, um, and, you know, for example, I'm thinking about the Rickadick 30-year anniversary um, in April last year and how um, when we were expecting to see the work of families, the work of um, frontline responders on the on the front cover, we, we instead saw coverage of Prince Philip's death. Um, we instead saw um, something that I find um, mind-boggling, the, the you know, that the week after that Rickadick 30-year anniversary, Queensland passed um, draconian youth justice legislation um, and the headlines even in the ABC were talking about hardcore youth offenders, to use that language of, of the, the Queensland debate there. But um, I think, yeah, often it's the, the people that are peddling the most punitive solutions um, that are afforded that prominent platform and whose solutions have, are the ones that we see have traction in the media and that are taken up by politicians. And I think that there's some variation of that that's happening with the debate on, on co the criminalisation of coercive control because, um, you know, where we see so much media attention and media resources given to those who, who take um, the most punitive position that just so happens to align with the police lobby. Um, and if you happen, if you want to um, argue for the expansion of police powers, for the creation of new criminal offences, for more resources for police and for prisons, um, it's quite easy to get a place on Sky News or um, afforded a big um, platform. And I think we see that like last year in December when the New South Wales Attorney General, Mark Speakerman, announced a decision to create a new criminal offence of coercive control. Um, and um, the, 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 oh, there's more I wanted to say, but the, the last point I just wanted to make was just also what um, Prof um, Chelsea Watergo Wodig was saying in, in more eloquently than I'm able to about the um, anyone who dares disagree with or challenge um, the carceral feminists and the, the Ningos in this space um, is likely mess to be met with that gaslighting that she described, um, that gagging um, and gatekeeping. Um, and I think she's right to draw, draw out the um, hypocrisy of that um, happening, um, you know, in the context of debates on, you know, what's essentially, you know, dominant, uh, um, domineering and controlling behaviour, right? Um, that um, uh, and you know, I, I know that um, I myself and 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 others have um, um, you know, when when daring to speak, um, been met with threats of defamation, formal complaints to um, to my manager, and so on. And um, I think um, for these reasons, like. Um, it's important that we actually think critically and ask ourselves: Is this? Is it? Can you even call it a debate um, if if there's voices that are excluded? Um, and I've kind of talked about the the debate of criminalising coercive control, but from this point on, I, I don't want to say it anymore because um, I don't think it is a debate. I think what we're seeing is just groupthink and propaganda, um, and we have to um, you know be careful about the words that we're using. Um, Amanda, um, I, I just know that the comments are saying how incredibly eloquent um, you are. Oh. I agree. So I think um, you're doing wonderfully. And uh, just reflecting on what you've all said, um, Crystal, you talked about how um, the focus is often on utilising the tools of the law and um, that's not new um, to this land. If you look at um, the events of colonisation, um, then federation and then multiple acts of controlling um, our mob through then it has been through the use of the law. Um, and we often see um, exclusion um, practices that go on there. When you look at the courts today, you don't see any Aboriginal people um, on the bench of the High Court. Um, at least I haven't. Um, you don't, haven't seen anybody um, in those higher courts where matters are discussed. You don't see um, the elevation of those voices in every jurisdiction. I think that finds it harder, but also the law itself and the way it's designed um, and set up means that, you know, arguments are had in a very lineal 
and mainstream manner, which then excludes those minority voices, which is exactly what it's designed to do, as is our political system. So um, I see what you see, Amanda, every day um, when we talk about bail, um, our women um, and our mob's experiences don't matter. When we talk about parole, um, they're ignored. When we talk about the need um, for community resourcing um, and empowerment, that is instead relegated to the field of, well, let's look at the legal tools first. Well, we're telling you the legal tools don't work. Um, and when you are um, somebody who doesn't agree um, or doesn't fall in to that mainstream subset of thinking, you are often excluded um, from conversations about resourcing and reform, which then just perpetuates the cycle, which is what I think is so groundbreaking in some ways by social media is that we can have these conversations out in the open and we got the benefit of that on this topic um, through your discussion, um, Naoka's and um, Chelsea's and Crystal's on coercive control. Um, I think this one um, is, is fairly self-evident, but um, I just think for the purposes of those who maybe aren't aware of it, we should quickly address it, is how, how pervasive is coercive control in the Victorian community and are Aboriginal women disproportionately subject to it? You're probably um, well-equipped to answer this too, Narita, but, you know, um, family. we know that family violence is... Um, is pervasive in all communities. So we know that um, it's a big societal issue and we know that Aboriginal women um, are disproportionately affected by this and we know that women in prison um, all are pretty much have experienced family violence as well. And, um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue and mm. yeah, we know that it is. I mean, it's something that is often weaponized against community um, in a way that is utilised to put them away um, or to exclude them from services um, and the like. And in terms of um, how disproportionately pervasive is it, it's incredible. Um, when you look at coercive control, we're talking upwards of 80% of Aboriginal women have been subjected to coercive control who are in prison. Um, that's not talking about numbers who um, might have been released, um, community corrections orders, um, those who haven't yet come to that attention but are going through um, I hate using this word, uh, to, uh, the child protection, because it certainly doesn't feel like child protection at all. Um, all of those systems, um, those rates are incredibly high. Now that we've answered the obvious, um, let's move on um, to really understanding what are your motivations um, for sort of leading this campaign against criminalising coercive control? Um, I can jump in. Um, so growing up, um, I saw a lot of it around me and I've, I, as an adult and a teenager, I supported a number of friends and family um, going through this type of violence. Um, and I've also seen, like, my cousins sort of go through, you know, the revolving doors of the prison, like in and out, in and out, in and out, um, and like what I've witnessed is that criminalizing, like it does, it doesn't stop, it doesn't stop the thing. It, it like we know that the measures or that we've put in for family violence, like it hasn't stopped women dying. So criminalizing obviously doesn't work. I think um, what I I think there's also this like something that frustrates me about this conversation is that there's this like perverse irony at play where structurally everyone in the country, but especially black fellows and especially black women are in a coercive controlled relationship with the government. So mechanisms like the police, like so-called child safety, child stealing, uh, things like Centrelink, you know, Department of Housing, um, in many different ways control the lives of people and like we are, it's funny that we can accept this on a structural level, but, you know, we want to criminalise it on a sort of interpersonal level. Um, so, I don't, yeah, I, I've got nothing else to say. I'll probably have more to say. But, um, yeah, it's obvious, like, we are against coercive control. Like, I think we can all agree that it's, you know, toxic and it's shit and it, really diminishes people and it is like it leaves people really broken but I'm more interested in asking 
Like what, okay, well, what if we didn't get the police involved? Like what if we, what, because we ask those questions anyway, what if there was another way? What if, you know, I've got a cousin who's 15 and I can see him already doing this stuff with his girlfriend, you know, checking her Facebook or whatever. I'd like to know, I'd like to have resources to have that, those sort of yarns and stop them early rather than just, you know, waiting 10 years time for him to be locked up or whatever. Anyway, I'll stop. No, that's incredibly um, interesting, Nayoka. Um, Crystal, I see you've unmuted. <laughs> I was just going to, um, I just I just don't think that strengthening a system which we know targets the Aboriginal community and the black community, like why would we want to do that? Why would we want to expand police powers and the criminal justice system powers when we know that this system, we know that policing practices and we know that the system itself targets Aboriginal people like this is not expansion of these laws are not going to protect anybody they're going to create further harm and I guess that's the overriding um uh reason why um I would put myself in this debate but um um and it's not a debate as Amanda said and you know I, I find it frustrating too um just to when Nay was talking, I was just thinking, I find it frustrating how the black people in this come in this in this debate or this online thing are positioned as coming from like a place of anger or a place of supporting perpetrators or supporting people perfect in that inverted commas, by the way, or um supporting further violence. And so like it's like actually, and I think the Val's um uh policy paper and also the one that um the Sisters Inside and the Institute for Collaborative um, Race Research, I think it is one that Professor Watergo is um, one of the co-directors of. The papers that have come out um, of these places do a really good job of exposing, you know, this is actually the evidence which says this doesn't work, um, it's not going to protect people, it's um, going to create further harm, you know, um, and as Jurgen said about the Royal Commission, it's not even a recommendation in the Royal Commission that was spent millions um, of in this state so the kind of discourse and the racializing of black people involved in this debate as though we're shooting from the hip and not um not coming from an evidence-based or you know a place of um leading with love as professor Watergo might say or um of protecting our communities from further harm it's incredibly frustrating these kind of white women's moves to virtue and um yeah, like it, it frustrates the hell out of me. And um, the racism that operates in the debate, I guess, is um, find it really um, frustrating. I also, sorry, if I could just jump in. Sorry, Amanda, if you were. I just, I, I can't, I can't see how, like let's, if they even, you know, manage to prosecute someone on this, like I, I can't see how, you know, it, like proving it is going to be so really challenging. But I, I don't see how prison is going to make someone less likely to practice those, you know, to have those behaviours when they get out because they will get out when prisons are such violent places and you uh, control, you, your whole environment is controlled. How, how do you expect people to change under those conditions? It just, yeah, it just really just makes zero sense to me. It just feels punitive and really lacking in imagination and really just what really serving white women, middle-class white women. Mm. Please jump in. Um, yeah, and you've covered most of my points, so that's good. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate the points that Crystal and, and Naoka made about the – and I'm, one key concern for me has been – what Crystal said about the spread of misinformation, because especially in in the state of Victoria, when as Tarnin and, and Jurgen were saying that it's been there's been a civil regulatory framework in place since 2008. There's been a royal commission, um, and I think I get concerned that when there's statements out in the public record saying that we don't have coercive control in law or we need to create an offence in the state of Victoria, I think that 
fuels misunderstandings um, that might actually stop people taking action for themselves and going to to seek help from a CLC or from legal aid or legal representation or whatever, um, you know, but other motivations um, you know, f- f- from a personal perspective is that um, I see the criminal law as a very blunt instrument um, in addition to what Naiku was saying around, um, um, you know, the criminal law being a, and prisons being a way of, um, uh, you know, they're not a silver bullet solution, but also I think there's a need to be sceptical about the role that the criminal law could play in regulating coercive control anyway. Um, and part of that is, is I think it's especially important to be um, sceptical about the, when there's a well, very well documented problem of um, sexism and racism within police workplace culture. Um, and I just wanted to just, I had two examples I just wanted to discuss briefly, if that's okay. Um, the one one was a Queensland case, so sorry for chopping and changing here, but um, in 2020, um, there were 84 serving um, QPS um, officers who were named as alleged respondents to domestic violence protection orders. And um, at the time, the Queensland Police Commissioner, um, who was Brian Codd, when asked um, by a journalist about whether um, women would have the confidence coming forward when they, the police they interact with um, might have prejudiced attitudes or even be accused of abuse themselves. Court actually said on the public record, and I quote, um, can I say there's a 100% guarantee that won't happen? Well, I can't. And I think, you know, that kind of statement that is indicative of if that's the level of so-called leadership, then, you know, it speaks volumes of that police workplace culture that's under it Um, and that's not true only for um, sexism but it's also true for racism it makes me think for example of when New South Wales police commissioner came out saying you know when there was you know and there's so much CCTV evidence of um, instances of unlawful and improper police use of power against young Aboriginal children and boys uh, and girls and you know statements like oh well this is a cop had a bad day that says everything that you need to know about the 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 institutional um, workplace culture there and I should add as a footnote that you know just two weeks ago that Queensland Police Commissioner Cod was suspended on full pay for allegedly failing to report a family violence incident while he was in that leadership role. Um, and of course, many of you will have followed um, um, what has the allegations that have been made about um, a New South Wales Police Commissioner um, Fuller since he retired. Um, and the other example I had was just to, to make sure we focused on Victoria was that um, data obtained under a freedom of information request revealed that for Victoria Police Service in 2019, 82 Victoria police officers were charged with family violence offences. And um, we know um, that some of these officers may have fa- faced disciplinary action like demotion or being transferred or suspended um, without pay, but not one has been sacked or dismissed. Um, And um, some of the reasons for this include the weak disciplinary systems of the police investigating the police. And the other part is the very powerful police union. Um, And these two factors combine to mean that it's notoriously difficult to sack a police officer, even when there's criminal charges that have that have been prosecuted in a court. So, um, and for anyone who wants to read more, um, you can look on the public record about um, the story of um, Senior Sergeant Neil Punchard, um, the police officer who was stood down on full pay in December 2018 um, for hacking uh, who, and who's pleaded guilty to hacking into a police database and leaking the information of, of adre- and, and addresses of a uh, police uh, a domestic violence victim um, to her violent form partner. Um, so um, I'll just leave that example there. Um, but yeah, like Crystal as well, concerned about the spread of misinformation, um, especially as I said earlier, with the fact that um, um, f- for those reasons, um, so I won't dwell on that point. And then the only other point I had, which was um, I, I'm also the final point, sorry, um, and then I'll shut up, was that I'm also sceptical about the motivations of politicians and carceral feminists for some of the reasons that I've raised earlier um, that, um, you know, um, and Professor Megan Davis, for example, has um, spoken about um, the need for um, caution in applauding, um, to use her words, easy announceables. And I like that expression of of easy announceables. I think we need to be um, cautious when we look at, um, you know, those 
populist um, politics that I was talking about earlier, especially when um, there's, you know, um, a whole, as Crystal was saying, evidence base of royal commissions, um, you know, law, Victorian law, not, not just for family violence, but also for bail. Nerida, you were talking earlier about bail, like these are the key drivers for skyrocketing incarceration rates and it's all hidden in books um, and, um, you know, and, um, yeah, I, um, yeah, the only last point I had to make was just that um, as we, that, that has been made more eloquently by others was just a, a concern for the growth of prison and police industries here in the state of Victoria. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly. And um, I, I note that some people in the um, chat function are, are wondering if there is um, any evidence um, from jurisdictions that have coercive control um, legislation as to whether there's been a positive effect. Um, if you look um, at um, the evidence, um, particularly if you look at, say, the UK, who's um, had those uh, offences in place um, the longest, uh, there is actually no evidence um, of public attitudes or understanding to suggest that knowledge about family violence and coercive control has improved, um, nor has coercive control um, ever been held as a primary offence, um, or um, net They've also found that uh, police aren't called out um, to assist individuals where they're alleging coercive control. Um, it's always been attributed to a, a, another primary offence. So important to remember. Um, and that the Australian Law Reform Commission, New South Wales Law Reform Commission, also found that there's actually insufficient evidence to conclude that improvements cannot be realised within existing frameworks um, and Amanda talked to um, what's already existing within the civil frameworks. Um, or the Nebrella offence would actually achieve the desired outcomes in terms of changing community or practitioner attitudes towards family violence. Um, and there's been no, no filling of the evidence gap for quite some time. Um, and there's also really important to remember that um, legislative, con or they, what they call legislative condemnation, um, and the symbolic value of it actually doesn't translate um, there's multiple instances of this um, that we can see in our own um, law books. Um, and certainly, um, you know, if you look at family violence reforms, as um, a result of the Royal Commission of Family Violence, um, a lot of those reforms actually resulted um, in women um, being criminalised further and, like Amanda again referred to, um, the skyrocketing rates of our women who are imprisoned. So symbolic condemnation doesn't actually work at all. Um, what often... Um, puts in place because, again, uh, you know, minority voices aren't part of the law conversation or law development. Um, unintended consequences are that we ended up in jail, we ended up penalised, and once again, um, you know, even after 200 years, we uh, often pay for the mistakes of um, our colonisers. So um, important uh, things to note. And, again, I'm being a terrible host. So uh, moving on. Being a great host. <laughs> Moving on to the next uh, question, uh, and I kind of feel like we've we've been talking about this um, in in many different ways, and I think Amanda talked to them um, also in some of her case examples. Are uh, you know what are some of the reasons for misidentification, and how much of a problem is it likely to be if coercive control was criminalised? Mm -hmm. But more importantly, for um, my kind of viewpoint is why do colonial institutions tend to favour castle responses to violence? I feel like some of the, like, some, like we've, um, I'll probably just be restating probably some of the things that have already been said, but in terms of misidentification, um, well, racism's one of the <laughs> primary reasons, right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's this, um, I'm not sure if we said it before or I said it when I was talking with Nay and Amanda earlier, but and Tani earlier, but, um, you know, there's this binary that happens where you're either um, a victim or a perpetrator, you know, a law-abiding citizen or a criminal, you know, and, um, you know, and once, you know, and the way criminalisation works, it, um, you know, targets, controls, surveils, um, does all of that thing to black people and, um, you know, and then also, in amongst all of that, it um, creates worthy people, worthy of protection or worthy of um, 
worthy of, yeah, like deemed worthy of protection. And, um, you know, uh, this is other people's, you know, long histories of work like Robin Kelly and Angela Davis and others have all spoken about this. You know, I'm just um, bastardising what they've done and condensing it now. But this is the way, you know, racialization works. And, um, yeah, so when, you know, you have Aboriginal women calling police and they're meeting them and then, you know, you've got all of these racialization happening and those deemed worthy of protection, you know, um, different people are caught up in different areas. So people are ringing police and then, um, you know, having other um, matters that then put them in the bucket of being not worthy of protection. They're no longer law-abiding, they're on the other side. And then they're getting caught up in um, the criminal justice system themselves. And so the reasons why they've called police for help and then um, they're not getting the help and then they're getting further, um, yeah, they're getting yeah caught up, criminalised, caught up in the system and all the rest of it. And, you know, and we know too with criminalisation as well once and that kind of that kind of dualism and binary that happens, once you move from being worthy of protection or... Um, you know, into law abiding into the other, it's very hard to get out of there as well. Like it's near on impossible. And we know this from um, uh, the ways that people are discriminated against in terms of um, criminal records, for instance, or other mechanisms. Like you can look outside of this um, debate around coercive reconcil- uh, reconciliation. <laughs> yeah, that too, but um, <laughs> a bit of a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> coercive control if you look outside of um <laughs> this to see the way that it works um elsewhere anyway and you know I encourage people to look at it look outside of this debate to see the way that um policing works on the ground and you know um that's a very long-winded um answer to your question about why people are misidentified but you know and then you know you have the extreme um you know, you have the way that the system works um, in terms of murdering people inside and people dying inside. And um, I think Tanine said before, mystery is one of the examples, and there's many, many more. And, you know, there's many people who are inside now that um, have called police and then been put inside because of calling police for help and then found themselves caught up in these ways. Um I know one of the main reasons, I guess, that we're all against um, expanding police powers or expanding the criminal justice system in these ways. Um, so that's a long-winded answer. And why do they favour castle responses? Because the system protects itself. It like it strengthens itself. It um, it um, for all the reasons that we've mentioned throughout this conversation. Like it just silences outside voices and then looks to solutions that um, expands the prison industrial complex and the carceral colonial system, you know. It's always, you've always got to remember that um, the penal system and policing and all of that are essential um, of, colon- of, of ongoing col- colonialism and ongoing colonising in this country. Like it's not, it's a central way that it happens and um, you can't divorce the current criminal justice system um, has been built upon since um, first contacts, you know. And so it's really important to remember that and um, don't let the kind of carceral feminists or the people that are dominating the debate tell you any otherwise. Just always um, look to Aboriginal women's voices and look to the people um, who do this sort of work to and the, and the legal services and everything who you know, in all the papers that you guys do, you talk about this stuff. You know, it's not this this information isn't hard to find, you know. Just go look at the legal services, go look at the community control dogs, you know, read the stuff and um inform yourself. I might I jump know, in there, but anyway. <laughs> um yeah, speaking to your first question there, um around misidentification, I think, like, first and foremost, the police are a racist, white, like, patriarchal institution. So when they encounter black women, of course, they're not, they're not ever going to act in our best interest. They, they're like, they're, they're just simply not designed to. They need to be abolished. Um, like, personally, 
like on the ground, um, like speaking from personal experience, when my family was experiencing um, family violence when I was a kid, um, you know, by the time, you know, I think mum probably, I think mum wrote about it in a book. Um, so it's like a matter of public record or whatever. Um, you know, she would call the police and by the time they rocked up, she's this hysterical black woman and, you know, he's the, you know, violent person who's calmed down. So, it, it like, he was able to use the system against mum and then, you know, when she tried to leave, would call child safety and say we were at risk and so child safety participate in the abuse of, you know, in mum's abuse and, you know, we get taken away and, like, checked or whatever. Um, so it's really because of existing ideas about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, it's very it's e easy for those to be weaponized by a white, white patriarchal institution. Um, which brings me to your second question around why do they tend to favour carceral responses? I think, well, like, yeah, I, I guess agreeing with what Crystal said, it, it needs to exist in order for the state to survive. Like it, the, the, the current system, it, 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 to reimagine something else would be, we would be living in a different place. And personally, I would like to be in that place um, rather than this colonial hell. Um, but yeah, but these are institutions that are, they were established to be, to maintain white patriarchy. Um, and so things, that's why things like trying to criminalise coercive control, we, we give, what we do is when we give them more money, we, we end up giving police more money, we give them more power, and we thus invest more taxpayers' dollars into upholding white patriarchy, and that's what these white feminists are doing. It just, it's just a really bizarre logic to me. Um, yeah, I think, I think there's a real fear, and this is why what community control, why community control is so important. Like we can take it upon ourselves to do the work in our own communities. We can not call the police. We can figure out, you know, we know that there are organisations out there and people out there, networks out there who want who want to do this work, um, but that's not where the government wants to put their money. All right, I'm done. Um, and I'll just echo points that have been established already by Crystal and Nayuka by saying that in terms of that first question why is there this misidentification um as others have already said um more eloquently police criminalize black victims of violence because of racism and misogyny which exists um as Nuka was saying not just in the police workplace culture but also in child again i don't want to use the term in the child um protection industries um and i think that means that there's these um and you see this in nearly every case of um domestic violence and also in the in terms of the police failure to, to protect um aboriginal women and children um in terms of cold cases deaths in custody um and and um for example the um these cover these issues have been covered um excellently by um, Aboriginal journalists such as um, Amy Maguire, Alan Clark and distinguished Professor Larissa Brent, um, among many others. Um, the case of Bowerville, for example, um, the, when, when families come to the police um, looking for, 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 for support, um, the homicide squad was, was not called. Uh, Docs was called first. And this is a, you know, a, a, a pattern that, that, that's repeated across cold cases. Um, and across um, in police responses to domestic violence. Um, and um, I think, um, yeah, the, the other question, why do colonial institutions tend to favour those castle responses? Yeah, these these points have already been said by, by others, but just it, got, it does go back to um, that, you know, um, I think Naika said the penal colon, col colony mentality um, and that, um, you know, Australian identity that 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 you know Australia's history and identity as a as a British penal outpost and that was invaded and colonised um, for the purposes of dealing with Britain's crime problems and um, you know some of the 
first colonial buildings, whether you're um, up here in Grafton, um, whether you're in Melbourne or we're in Sydney, they're prisons and, and barracks and the police officers, um, the first ever state police officers were literally, you know, to I'm talking about archive archival sources here, I'm not exaggerating, um, you know, made up of just the best behaved convicts. Um, and the police in 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 this in in Australia, you know, that's that is the legacy of the police is that they were developed in order to expand the colonial frontier to protect white property, not people, white property, um, to to help expand that frontier and to work with the squat local squatocracy in all of these places. Um, and um, I would say that that. Um, in terms of Australia's love affair with prisons and cops, none of that has actually changed um, at all. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I see that, um, you know, I'm uh, zooming in today from Yeagle country um, where I live and we've got a $2.3 billion contract here um, with the British corporation Serco. And Serco um, has not, not just in terms of the private prisons, they also have um, the, the in terms of the 12 contracts that, that Australia has for Im immigration detention prisons, um, and they are prisons. Um, they're owned either by G4S or Serco, and all that, all this money, these massive industries that are going to um, British um, uh, corporations, and um, it's um, really frustrating and sad and and intolerable in to see um, the you know um, the amount of money that's just poured into these industries. Um, prison industries, police industries, um, you know, Victoria said um, earlier, record police budgets. And at a time when around the rest of the globe, we're seeing some place, some jurisdictions like even Los Angeles, um, New York, Minneapolis, um, defunding the police. And in Victoria, it's been a record budget of 4.08 billion, um, including record um you know, the last police budget included 3,300 new recruits. Um, it's so it's an unbelievable amount of money, um, $100 million just for the litigation that police have to, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's mind. When I, when I think about the, um, the contributions of um, local and advocacy of local elders, whether it's up here on Yeagle country or down in, 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 in Melbourne in terms of local organisations and activist collectives um, doing the work and their budgets. Um, it's really sickening. Um, and um, I do want to, would prefer to um, live in a world like Nayuka explained with, and that these, these there are so many individuals and organisations leading these campaigns, but that are just um, systematically and chronically underfunded. Um, and, um, you know, it's not just true of the prisons and the, the mega prisons, including that, as I said, $2.3 billion contract here for Australia. So Australia's, um, and that's one last thing I'll just say is that, um, you know, I think we started by talking about the fact that people have been excluded from the conversation. I think, um, yeah, that's part of it is that, you know, I just want to acknowledge um, some of the individuals that have run some of these campaigns, including here, um, Arnie Joyce Clegg, who has led that campaign to stop the prison on her country and has been part of the 67 referendum, so made contributions nationally and internationally. We just don't read in school curriculum about these contributions. It's not in the media. Um, when we, when she was trying to lead that campaign to stop the construction of the 1,700 bed facility here, we weren't even able to get a, 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 an op-ed um, in the conversation or in Fairfax or in the ABC, and I'll call them all out, because of the national election. Um, it wasn't deemed worthy of part of the conversation at that particular moment in time and it's still not considered part of a lot of the school curriculum or uni curriculum um, though in terms of those achievements and just um, the reality of what's going on um, in 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 um, in these states um, you know also wanted to talk about the one final point I make is about it's not just prison budgets but even in, in Victoria there's been record budgets for, for prisons as well um, and um, there's been um, uh, again, inexcusably, um, I, I do, it's a state of emergency at this particular moment in time. There's been four deaths in Victoria's maximum security prison, DPFC, including one baby. 
and it is a state of emergency. And I just wanted to conclude by saying that I'm humbled to be on a panel um, with those that have led the protest to bring public attention to this emergency um, against all odds. Yeah. Yeah, um, certainly, Amanda. Um, you know, um, we're incredibly proud of our work um, in representing families um, who have lost loved ones um, in custody. And um, you talked about the record investment um, in prisons. And um, also there was a little Christmas present for police on the 23rd of December when they announced $120 million, um, for tasers. Um, across the state um, and this is and then subsequent to that yet we find out they couldn't even um, correctly swear in their police officers and they had 1200 police officers running around who were incorrectly sworn in um, record investment in prisons to expand um, but nothing um, for prison health care um, nothing for oversight nothing for opcat all these things that could um, assist um, those inside um, particularly when um, two deaths um, really highlighted um, the issue of prison health care. But we've also seen, you know, recent reports of incredibly um, high rates of self-harm in prison um, from our mob right now, um, let alone um, the fact that we saw Aboriginal suicides increase um, by 75% here in Victoria over two years with just as a triggering factor. Um, so I get quite heated when I see budgets and budget day is always a bad day for me. Um, and a bad day for my husband and family, anybody around me, um, because it is always, always so skewed um, to the punitive of our society and not enough in the prevention um, and service sector. And that brings me to one of the questions in our Q&A, which is um, what, um, how can we address coercive control in the community without criminalisation and what is that first step? One thing I think that um, is important in these sorts of conversations to talk about, you know, what it is, the community legal education um, around the video that um, was played earlier around what it is and to start having these conversations and um, understanding what it is. Like I think that that's where, like through our relationships with each other and through um those sorts of avenues. I, I think that um, in the VALS report too, you talk about um, the needing to fund the community legal education, fund community services that are working in the area because I think specific, uh, specifically things like Aboriginal services or um, women's legal services or um, other sort of targeted um, other sort of targeted community legal services and supports women's um women's um, family violence services and all the rest. Like these are the organisations which can lead the community legal education in their communities and lead um, discussions around how to shift behaviours and to shift um, and, and create change. Uh, that's, that's one of the ways. I'll probably think of more as you guys jump in, but um, Change has to start through our relationships with family and community, and um, without these kind of these kind of top down punitive things, are just never going to work. Mm. I also think um, it's important, Crystal, that we widen that conversation about coercive control, mm. particularly for Black women, in understanding that there is also that coercive control of the state. Um, that we experience each and every day. I think we need to have that more fulsome conversation um, and agree with your comments on community education. Tani does an excellent job in leading our CLE and that exists purely off an oily rag of donations um, that we receive. Um, mm -hmm. like this Donate more, you mob. <laughs> <laughs> things that you're listening, I mean, this webinar that you're listening today, um, again, facilitated by donations. Um, so, um, you know, and it's not just, um, whilst we do appreciate the donations and definitely think about that if you're able to, also donate to organisations in other jurisdictions, particularly the ones that you live in, um, your local ATSOs, your flat outs, your sisters inside. Um, really important to also be supporting those organisations as well. Um, Nurka and Amanda, do you, uh, Nurka's got her hand up, so she's next. Um, yeah, I, I'm really, I guess, because I've got, um, I've got four kids in my care, so I'm really interested in how, like, things start at home and how culture starts, you know, at home and in the families and in, you know, then community and so on and society. Um, I, 
I think a big part of this, in addition to supporting like women's legal services and that sort of thing, I think um, organisations like Dadi Manwaro are also really important in this yarn. Um, like men, I think that when, A, I think a lot of this behaviour is normalised, especially in young people. And I know Jitta does a lot of good work um, with like young, young girls and young women around like healthy relationships. So I think like, I think we got, there's a lot of work to do to, um, to clock that stuff, stuff really early. Um, and then there's also work that, like, I think there can be a lot of shame for fellows who are using violence in relationships. Um, and that's why that whole binary of perpetrator and victim and, like, demonising people, we, I think we, we need to, I don't know, I don't know what language to use here, make it safer or make it more acceptable for men to get help or for boys to get help with the, if they are doing this or any actually I mean we're all you know domination culture that um Annie Bell Hooks talked about we're all capable of hurting each other um but if if people need a place to go to change like they need support to change and so I think we need to be funding that and yeah, yeah. Uh, have to be held by community you can't yes ability yes. processes that um seem to be sweeping, you know, the left and things like that. I find them so problematic and harmful, particularly when they're um, pushing people out of communities when actually we need to bring people in and we need to talk about how, like, accountability that doesn't mean punishment in yeah. that, you know, like an accountability that actually results in healthier and healthier relationships and healthier communities. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that part. But, yeah, it's really? like people out of community doesn't work and that's why, what you know, Daddy Monroe and um, Vaxel, Men's Service and, like, there's a lot of bars um, in, uh, talking about Victorian yeah. organizations at the moment. But um, And I'm sure there's, other, like, obviously nationally and internationally for other people joining us from afar. But um, all of these services are really important, um, uh yeah, like for people to be able to go to and, you know, um, accountability and, yeah, the accountability and um, behavioural change and things like things like that are not a straightforward process or straightforward narrow, like, road, you know, like we're talking about um, community, like our community, like not just our original community, all of our community, um, you know, family violence is prevalent with it housing, education, like we've got problems across the board. And so undoing all of those things or working towards creating more just worlds is not going to be a straight forward path. And um, it's a work in progress always. And we have to um, figure out ways to strengthen community and strengthen the people um, involved in these situations, you know, and um, create change in those ways, I think. Sorry if that was a bit waffly, but I really, I really do believe, like community, are, we are so much more capable than the police of dealing with this. Like we, yeah, we we have we have the knowledge, and like this sort of behaviour, this coer you know coercive control and violence, these are inherited from like their colonial sort of mentalities um, and we need to, like, unlearn them. We need to do that work. Anyway, yeah. Amanda? I've got nothing to add to all of that except that, you know, it's um, there's a need to adequately fund um, those cultural, those frontline responders um, to, you know, suicide and to harm prevention that are, that are culturally safe and that's not the police, that's not... Um, industries um, and there's so many um, people that do this work every single day um, you know for um, for no recognition um, and and um, you know um, that are locally based and um, um, yeah it, it, um, 
I'd really like to see um, those services um, resourced properly. And again, just to, to it's not just my opinion. That's something that's been repeated in those, all those reports in the VALS report, in the in, in research by Anne Rose in in the Royal Commission for Vic Family Violence. Like it's again, it's these things are hidden in books. It's not just something that I think is true. Anyway. Um. Thank you um, to our panellists today for a really important and riveting discussion. Um, thank you to everyone who has joined us on Zoom today. We really appreciate, appreciate all of you taking the time to come and listen. Um, if you want to support the work that VOWS does, you can make a donation at vows.org.au um, slash donate, um, and your donations give us a freedom to do work that we might not be able to do otherwise. Um, and, again, um, just a reminder to also look at the other organisations that we talked to today as well as your local um, ACOs and ATSOLs um, and um, family support services to empower community and to give us the ability to do what we do best, which is self-determined programs um, that work more effectively than any prison or law will do. A reminder that if today's discussion raised any issues or concerns for you, we encourage Aboriginal Islander people to call Yarning Safe and Strong, um, run by VARS on 1800 959 563, um, and anyone is able to call Lifeline on 13 11 14.